Olympia Jones. And I just I know Paul's written about this in, in, in some sort of stuff he's mentioned. Um, I think yeah. it's an example of Saturday Night Live when there was this sort of very disparaging remarks made about um, you know whatever rednecks Trump, yeah. and stuff kind of yeah. thing. And that seems to be you know you watch The Simpsons, but the yeah. only minority group yeah. or a small group that's allowed to be portrayed in a negative way is a kind of the redneck yokel kind yes. of thing. Is, 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 and Hillary Clinton, you know, when she called Trump's yes. words deplorables, is, is there something in that d- divide between that the elite is looking down on it, or um, a, a, a big chunk of people feel that? Yes, come and it was ever thus, semicolon. Um, I, wor- I worked for, for Jimmy Carter. I was a speechwriter during the campaign and, and, and the, the White House. And he was the first real Southerner in sort of modern times to win a president. You know, Lyndon Johnson wasn't really a Southerner, and then you have to go back. And Woodrow Wilson was sort of a quasi-Southerner. But, but part of, and Carter carried most of the South as, as a Democrat, as sort of now sort of a famously pious a Democrat. And the reason was largely regional pride, regional uh, chip on the shoulder. I think this is a long theme in, in American um, American life. Who was the famous critic who wrote the pale faces and um, uh, pale faces and redskins? Um, you know, one of you will come up with this. It was a famous essay 50 or 60 years ago about uh, that there has always been a coastal versus inland divide. Mark Twain writes about this a lot. Henry James, it was one of his big, big themes. And one, it was something that we saw in very clear ways in our travels around the country because we often went to places that were very conscious of being looked down upon. Um, the bottom of that looked down upon barrel is a place where I spent my sort of pre-kindergarten years, which is Mississippi. Um, they didn't accept me as a local, but uh, that's where I, uh, so, but, but at Mississippi, uh, my, my dad was a Navy doctor there. They, they've been able to use their sense of being the bottom, you know, they're always number 50 or 51, depending how many states you're counting and in any ranking. But when they've been succeeded in industrialization or whatever, they're saying, yeah, we're doing it here in Mississippi. Central Valley, California, same thing. Um, West Virginia, Eastern Kentucky, the same thing. So yes, this was part of it, but I think in every presidential election, you can find some of this cultural tension. So I think the um, so, so that that's my that's my answer. Okay. It, it is this thus and has ever been. This but it has a deep. There's not a marked deep thing of that division. If you compare it with um, with say the late 1960s, when you had uh, you know divisions of of the Vietnam War, and you had uh, construction workers in New York actually taking lead pipes right. to anti-war protesters. So. It is an issue and has been an issue for much of our history. Okay, great. Okay. I, I, just, oh, yeah. I, just finish this quickly. I mean, I think there's another element mm-hmm. to it also, and that is that there's a sense among those that don't live on the coast. Yeah. You know, I, I have an interesting history. I, yeah. I grew up in a very wealthy part of the country, yeah. um, in New Jersey, probably one of the wealthiest count, yeah. counties um, in the country. And I've lived the first half of my life there and the second half of my life in one of the poorest mm-hmm. you know, places. Um, so I just sort of have seen both sides. and. What the people in, you know, when we say Youngstown, by the way, we're not really talking about the city, we're talking about the region. But, you know, the people in that region, they have a sense, you know, they would say the elites. Yeah. Um, and that the game is rigged um, in favor yeah. of the elites and against them. And people in mm-hmm. Youngstown mm-hmm. always think the fix is in. Um, it's a place that has a long um, organized crime history um, to it, so yeah. that sort of adds to it. Um, it's hard to name a public official um, who didn't end up getting indicted, yeah. including the current mayor, um, including our former congressman who went to jail for eight years. Um, so the, the thought was that, that, that everything is rigged, and it's not what you know, it's who you know. And the elites are connected. Um, they have this network. You know, Peggy Noonan has written about this sort of, they're, they're the protected, and the people in Youngstown are the unprotected by that. I don't know if you've any read um, J.D. Vance's book, The Hillbilly Elegy. And you know, what I took from that book is, is actually the, the later chapter Almost the last chapter was the most fascinating when he goes to I don't know it's to Harvard or Yale, um, and he's suddenly part of this elite network. I and mean, he talks about the fact that you don't really have to apply for jobs at that point. You, the networks bring the jobs to you. It's a different world, a different reality, and I think it's resented um, by those you know in the yeah. in the heartland, let's say, or, or those that aren't part of the elite. Um, and, and just to, to hop in, yes. And at any stage in American history, you'll find something helpful. I've been reading, uh, again, the works of Theodore Dreiser. I find it endlessly fascinating now. And I don't know if any of you have read American Tragedy. You know, it's like you know, a thousand pages long. But it's about exactly this tension for you know, Clyde Griffins, this Griffiths, this young, asp- young aspiring guy from Kansas City who gets this glimpse of the sort of gilded world of New York. So 
yes, it's an issue, and I, but I just want to say this is, this is who we are. But was there ever a candidate like Trump? It was um, George, George Corley Wallace, you know, who was a, who was a, I mean, he was a third party candidate in 68 mm -hmm. and then in 72. And part of our appeal in the 1976 campaign for the moral Jimmy Carter was, it's a crooked system. We need a government as good as its people. <laughs> so, so it, it's so. So I, I am supporting what you're saying, but also saying this is, it's, it's a high wave of a continuing curve. But I, but I think part of Trump's appeal too was for these voters, um, and I don't know which what Hillary Clinton said because I don't think that moved numbers very much. Um, the, the deplorable comment. Yeah. Um, I, but um, I just think that that Trump. I mean, one of the things you see. I, I spoke to a student who was very involved in the Trump campaign and sort of asking her, um, you know, why, why did Trump appeal to you so much? Because she, she didn't sort of fit the, the, the prototype as you thought of as a Trump voter, um, you know, working full time, getting two degrees, um, uh, very, very bright. And she said the rallies, um, that, you know, going to the rallies really moved her. The fact that Trump likes being among these people, or at least he fakes it very well if he doesn't like it. Um, because when he's there, you know, I went, I went to the rally in July, and he's, um, he, it almost feels like he's in his element. And, there, and I think that, that, that's a message, an implicit message that he's sending to, those, um, to his supporters. That I like you. you know, I'm with you. Um, I, I'm, I don't look down on you. you know, we're all in this together. Sort of this, this idea. He said it in his Cleveland speech. I'm your voice. Um, and I, that, that's appealing to them. Um. A 10-second compliment as opposed to, a, to with an a, as, as, as a post-challenge. Um, yes, and he is, has a very sort of powerful, he, the fact that he's both rich and coarse, I think, sort of appeal yeah. that, that way. But also, I think we do see a historically unprecedented combination of public affairs and entertainment. Because he, it is sort of like a World Wrestling Foundation rally. Right, very much, yes. And we like, everybody likes that, and so it's now sort of <coughs> more, center, more center stage than before. If Trump had run at the end of the Clinton uh, presidency in 2000, would he have got the nomination over uh, George W. Bush? It's conceivable. So I think the structures of the party were probably more uh, in place uh, than you know, the Republican Party until recently it had. There was a fascinating set of recent polls I saw, which is that if you if you were doing polls right now for the next presidential election, that is almost three years ahead of time, for in a, when you're not talking about an incumbent running for re-election, among Democrats, you never predict the actual nominee. You know, the person leading the polls three years ahead of time is never the actual nominee. It's some, some other, but Republicans, it usually has been, because Republicans, it's usually been the next guy. And, so I think that, that George W. Bush was the next guy at, at that time, as Mitt Romney was, et cetera. And the next guy now would have been Jeb, or whoever would, would have been the next guy in, in the last, last race. So I think that the structure of the party probably would have resisted Trump back in 2000. But Yeah, well, the other answer, I don't know the answer to this question. It would be, it'd be interesting. I don't know when the Republicans changed to allowing more sort of uh, proportional representation mm -hmm. in their primaries, which really was a, was a benefit to Trump that That's they weren't right. doing winner-take-all, yeah, right. because Trump had that core of support, and you're doing proportional, the bottom gets lost off, right, so a 20% yeah. that he had all the time became more like a 30% yeah. when you go into the primaries. Um, and of course, Republicans don't have superdelegates, um, unlike the Democrats. And, you know, I think if Trump had not won this time, um, and had lost badly to Hillary Clinton, and the Republicans had a reevaluation yeah. how they did things, I yeah. wonder if they would have thought about yeah. superdelegates right. doing sort of what the, yes. what the Democrats had done. Okay. Um, to give the party more weight. Mm -hmm. good, good, good. Pork, I know you wanted to come in. Yeah, party question from the Institute. Um, listening to James Fallows, it, uh, it can seem very comforting in some ways, but the other side of it is that um, Donald Trump is, is president, and Donald Trump can do an awful lot of damage to the American system in the next three years, not only the American system, but to the world as a whole. Uh, he can do an awful lot of damage to relations with Europe, relations with China, relations with Russia. Uh, damage which may not be recoverable. Uh, so I wonder about uh, uh, not disagreeing with yeah. you uh, that we shouldn't see the election of 2016 as establishing a, a trend which is irreversible. Uh, but. There is an awful lot wrong with uh, American politics at the federal level. 
Uh, there is, uh, for instance, uh, the <coughs> almost complete gerrymandering of house elections, for instance. Yes. Um, there is the role of money in American politics. Now, you could say that the election of Trump runs counter to that argument, but I don't think it does. Um, so, I think what we are worried about is, is the long-term damage that will be done. Uh, that's my first yeah. comment. The second uh, question is, uh, do you not think that in the 2016 election, Hillary Clinton was in fact a very bad candidate um, for the Democrat Party, Democratic Party. I mean, we, we all have heard that um, the margin was very uh, tight even in terms of the Electoral College, and if she had, for instance, gone to Wisconsin, um, and if she had paid attention to this part of what has been the core Democratic electorate, the outcome might have been different. Uh, what, what do you think of that, Tisha? So, so to take, take turns answering this, to start with your second point about, about Hillary Clinton, Again, looking back in this election, there are a million things that gone gone the other way. Um, I think that if I had to choose the most important, I think the New York Times played a powerful role in this outcome by treating the Hillary email email story as if it was of equal importance with everything happening with with Trump. And there was a famous front page in the New York Times ten days before the election after Comey's letter where the entire front page, except for like an inch at the bottom, was everything about the election in turmoil. So, so I think that, that was an important part. Hillary Clinton points out in her book, which actually is interesting, her book, uh, what happened, I, 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 you know, I, I didn't intend to read it, I had to read it for, for work, and it was, it was actually interesting. She points out, you know, Russ Langle, wonderful former senator from Wisconsin, he, he thought he was going to win. He was like, you know, six points ahead in the polls, and he lost by seven points or something, and he spent all his time in Wisconsin. You know, so she was saying that I was there pretty much, but I wasn't the only one who was surprised by the thing. So yes, she was a bad candidate. She got more votes than any candidate ever except Barack Obama. You know, she won by three million votes, so she, so she was... She was not as charming as her husband or as Barack Obama, but she... she um, a lot of things had to go that way for, for, for her to lose it. And um, so that would be a point on that. On, are things wrong at the national level? Yes, I think they are. Uh, to disclo disclose my interest, the Atlantic, which was founded in 1857, has issued three endorsements in its history. Number one, for Abraham Lincoln. Uh, number two, for Lyndon Johnson over Barry Goldwater. And number three, last fall, against Donald Trump. Now, we, we thought this was a that it was a person uniquely unprepared for, for the office. And so what I've written since then is essentially on the vector diagram between things he is doing and all the other forces in national and international life. And yesterday, last night in London, I was interviewing the Baroness uh, Kathy Ashton about the ways in which both the Iran deal and the Paris deal, with the ways in which all the other parties are trying to, to fight back. And so I think we see an important um, and not now determined struggle between the things he wants to do and the ways that other parts of the system are resisting. One other point, Arnold Schwarzenegger is my new hero. Uh, and this is not simply because I sat next to him at breakfast a couple of months ago in Santa Monica. That is a way to feel really horrible, to sit next to Arnold and you're saying, oh, my biceps need more room. <laughs> Just is. But anyhow, his, his role is now to end gerrymandering in the U.S. He got... Um, sort of honest districting done and it got in California and that's the message he's trying to bring to the rest of the country, especially the three states, which I think are Ohio, Pennsylvania, and North Carolina, where you have disproportionate uh, effect on the House. Good, good. Arnie's always been my hero. Is he a hero of yours? <laughs> yes. Well, I think, I think the gerrymandering, um, the Supreme Court might at least begin to take care of that. You yeah. know, there's a case this term and I think a lot of people suspect that they're going to rule against what went on in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I think it's a much larger effect at the state level than it is at the national level, um, you know, simply because if you're going to keep cities together, I don't know that it's going to change the makeup of Congress that much. You're always going to have sort of a Republican advantage because Democrats tend to cluster in urban areas, and there's not much you can do about that unless you're going to start breaking up cities a lot. But, you, but it would be different, and it would be less disadvantageous uh, to the Democrats um, if this were the case. What, what worries me more, and, and actually you're making me feel a little bit better about things, so thank you, but... Um, you know, I, I read, um, talking about the Electoral College, because yeah. it's something I'm really interested in, 
And um, Patrick Moynihan, Senator Moynihan, um, gave a speech sort of against changing the Electoral College many years ago. It's a wonderful speech. I can find it online. I encourage you to read it. Not just because of what he says about the Electoral College, but um, what he kind of said about American politics at the time. And, you know, what he, he was talking about his time as UN ambassador. And he said someone from a developing country came to him one day, when he's on the floor of the UN, and said, you know, you Americans, um, you're always trying to get us to, to fix our political systems. Um, you're always giving us all sorts of advice. He said, but you never tell us the one thing we need to know. And that is, how do you trust each other? Um, because that's what you have in the United States, and that's what's fundamental for democracy to work, that we have a basic trust for each other. And, you know, Moynihan was sort of talking about that's what we have now, and he had actually tied it to his argument for the, for the Electoral College. But that's what I worry we don't have anymore, um, which is so corrosive, is that we don't trust each other anymore. And that makes it very hard to run a democracy. And I don't know how we bring that back. I can see a lot of things that will make it worse, I don't see a lot of things that will make it better. And that, that's what concerns me more about our political system than any of the other things you talked about. And just Ford's point about the, uh, the United States role in the world is, is irreparable. Mm -hmm. like, you know, obviously, that assumes that Trump is not doing a good job. Perhaps somebody disagrees with that and that America first is the way to go. Uh, but your, your view on the United States' place in the world and whether it's being damaged? I'll let him go first. <laughs> Again, stipulating that I did not support Donald Trump in the, um, in, in the last election and have, have written a lot about sort of resisting his impulses and, and values. I think that there's, you know, Ireland is an interesting example. So, so there's not an ambassador here for one of the countries with which the U.S. has, has among the closest of relations, you know, with, with any, any countries on earth. And that is obviously the relationship suffers from that. There are countless other ways in which the U.S. and Ireland are and will be, you know, in the long, long term connected. I, I think it is a, the question is the ratchet effect of this, how many decisions made in the next couple of years will have a, an irreversible effect. I think that, that um, in the list I would put, I would start with North Korea, that that is a, a quite um, volatile and dangerous situation. Interestingly, I feel as if the Japanese, Chinese, and South Korean, otherwise often at each other's throats on this issue, feel as if they have some combined uh, balance uh, interest, of, you know, given the current U.S. role. Certainly, um, Kathy Eshton was saying last night that she thought it was happening with the Iran deal, that, that, that everybody else except the United States was sort of saying, how can we collectively find ways to make sure the Iran deal stays on, on course? Um, with the, the Paris Climate Accords, the mayors in the U.S. have essentially said, we're going to keep, we have enough leverage to make sure the U.S. still meets its targets, no matter what the national government is saying. Um, but obviously there was lost time, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the ways in which I personally would have fear effects that are very hard to re reverse would be military commitments or military accidents. They would be damage to U.S scientific and educational establishment by elbowing people out and diverting them to Canada or Ireland or, or wherever else they, they would be. And, and jeopardizing the assumption many people had, have had about the United States, which is it's too big, it's a bully, they're loud, we're tired of them, but they're not going to do anything really crazy. And I think that the Iraq war, in my view, was one pressure against that. Obviously, the Vietnam War is very, very controversial. But there has been, I think, a uh, we lived in China during the Obama election. And the Chinese were genuinely stunned by that, 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 that Obama could succeed, but then impressed that the United States could uh, elect somebody like this. And I, I, so we'll, we'll see what the next months and years hold for America's uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I, mean, I agree with everything you said, but the only thing I'd add to it is that you know, always remember how complex our system is, and um, presidents aren't always as powerful as you, as you think they are. Um, and you see it, use the NAFTA example. Um, you know, there's a real question about, for example, in trade agreements, what President Trump can do you know, unilaterally. Um, because when you have a trade deal, for example, like NAFTA, um, you know, there's legislation that goes along with it. And, Presidents cannot unilaterally repeal legislation. They have a lot of power. They have a lot of effect. Um, but, you know, they are somewhat limited. But on, you know, on sort of the worrisome side, you know, everything affects everything else. Um, and whenever the United States acts, 
you know, it, 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 it teaches a lesson and creates opportunities or closes down opportunities uh, for future actions. So in that way, it, there, it is worse. Um, do you think the checks and balances system has worked broadly? Marks out of 10? Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, and actually, we, you know, we've added additional non-Madisonian checks, right? You know, Madison didn't like political parties. Well, he joins one pretty quickly. But, um, you know, political parties have, and, and have added a check within the government. Um, disputes within political parties have added a check within the government. And one of the things, you know, things you see right now is that Republicans, because they're busy fighting with each other, because they're made up, actually, of multiple coalitions, have a very hard time. Um, you know, going along with a Republican president. We don't know if any of these things that President Trump wants um, or says he wants are actually going to happen uh, because of this division. Okay. Kian, you wanted to come in. Yeah, uh, my name's Kian. I work here in the Institute. Uh, you talked a lot about divisions and tensions within the country between coastal and central and elites and others, and etc. But one thing I was surprised it wasn't brought up was the racial division and tension in America. And as Tana Easy Coates wrote yeah. in your, in your um, magazine, very uh, very persuasively, the biggest indicator of how somebody voted in this election was not their age, their gender, or their income, it was their race. So, you know, you might not agree with his conclusion of yeah. what this means, but I'd like to hear your thoughts yeah. on that. So, so, you know, race and the heritage of slavery is the central sin, the central challenge, the central issue in, in American history. Uh, my magazine, The Atlantic, is called The Atlantic because it was American and English anti-slavery activists who founded in 1857 to, to uh, you know, across the Atlantic to, to, to work on this issue. And we were having dinner with ta in Paris two days ago, you know, sort of talking uh, about all these at, at the Sleep Lab conference. So, um, number one, I subscribe to the view that, that um, sort of racial animus as opposed to economic anxiety is a stronger predictor of, of, of Trump, Trump support. and and. Uh, you know, that's a there's a whole sort of um, literature on on each side of that. But I, I come down basically on Tanahasi's side of that. I remind, one way I differ from him again is that it was a chance, maybe not in a million, but a chance in a hundred that Trump actually ended up winning. There's so many things that would have led, led to him losing, and this, would that have given Tanahasi a, a different a different view? Um, so yes, that 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 racial tension, which to me I would define as black and non-black, rather than white and non-white, is, is the ongoing axis in administration of justice and in, in you know, police power and education and inequality and all the rest. I say it that way, black versus non-black, as opposed to white versus non-white, in that there's a huge discussion about whether all other immigrants essentially, eventually, quote, become white, unquote, where Asians and uh, 100 years ago, Jewish immigrants were thought to be sort of a whole sort of separate category, and now essentially everybody becomes white, which is a, as opposed to, to, to black. So yes, this is the issue of American life and American politics, and, and continues. Um, the one thing that's always kind of very interesting is, you know, these white voters in a place like Youngstown were very comfortable um, giving their votes overwhelmingly to the first African American president and then voting to re-elect yeah. that president. So you can't really see it, you know, sort of a simple racism. Mm. I think one way or the other. That's not that's not fair to them. But um, I think this also goes back to sort of the increasing distrust among Americans and people are, are falling into their groups um, because that's where they feel, you know, their trust is. And another project that I'm working on um, is sort of looking at, at um, a Supreme Court decision from way back in the 1950s. But I'm reading a lot of oral histories with from steel workers that were taken about 20 years ago um, for people who were sort of working in the in the mills in the 1950s and 1960s and one of the things that most surprised me when I when I read them is how much they talked about things that we would now call racial justice um, within the mills and in part it's because they considered themselves all brothers um, they were all part of the union and a lot of these people that I'm reading you know, were union leaders and sort of the, the racial animosity sort of broke down because they had something else that linked them together beyond race and you know, of course, now we've lost that. We've sort of lost the unions and things like that. But I think with this increasing distrust, now we we don't feel a sense of commonness. So everyone's sort of breaking down and fragmenting into their individual groups, and and the racial problem is part of that. Can I, can I volunteer a, a, a ten second addition? So about thirty years ago, I did a piece for the Atlantic, which may sound preposterous, but I would defend its premise. We were living then in Japan with our 
with our then little kids, and I was making, writing a piece saying essentially, I wished that every white American, especially every educated white American, could have to live in Japan for a year or two, because it's the only way to understand what it must be like, even if we were to have your race be the most important thing about you every second of the day. Mm -hmm. You know, as a white American, as Stephen Colbert would say, you know, you don't have to think about race. You know, it, my, my racial identity is something I don't have to think about in Japan. It was the central part of my being. And I think that, that is, a, again, a point ta and others have made, that there is simply, it is almost impossible to imagine what it's like to have your skin color be the main thing about you at all times. I lived in Japan for a year, too, so I can yeah. concur. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, Oliver Rubin, uh, former of the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, on the potential of uh, Trump to disappoint his, white, his working class voters, uh, Professor Strasick uh, suggested, or came close to suggesting, that uh, these jobs were not going to return and that it would become apparent, and presumably this would lead to disappointment. But are there not other things that could also uh, disappoint uh, working class voters. Uh, for example, uh, loss of health insurance cover. Uh, for example, uh, a perception that this um, uh, tax reform, should it be successful, uh, is perceived as um, uh, benefiting primarily the, the rich in society. Maybe there are other things. But I was wondering, um, if, there, if this disappointment is going to set in, is it going to set in before the next election? And if so, how could that manifest itself in American political life? Thank you. Good. We've only got a couple of minutes left, so we'll take the other remaining questions or points. Would you like to? Yeah. yeah. Um, so Lawrence Davis, University College Cork. I have a, a comment and, and a question. The comment is just in response to the, the debate, I suppose, um, a, a small debate about the yes but, um, about the tension between elitism yeah. and populism in American politics. And I would, I would agree yeah. that this is something that goes back to the Constitutional yeah. Convention, debates yeah. between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. It's always been there. But what I, what I would say on that point as well, the yes but, is that I think it's important, and, and political scientists have, have pointed this out, that there's been a particular breakdown in trust and a particular fragmentation, what political scientists call a crisis of democracy in the wake of um, politics of austerity, um, uh, the, um, the ascendancy of ne neoliberalism over such a long period of time, statistically de declining trust in political parties, in politicians, in, in government itself, and so I think it's, it's important to, 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 to be cognizant of the fact that although this has always existed, this tension between elitism and popular democracy in the United States, that there may be something, uh, uh, maybe something particularly significant mm -hmm. about the present time that Trump tapped into. I'm going to leave the prediction question to you, <laughs> of whether, whether the voters will be disappointed. I, I don't... I, I, they don't be, Who's he running against? Um, you know, candidates are important. One of the questions about Hillary Clinton came up earlier. You know, what's going to be the alternative? Um, I know we're really you know limited for time. I don't think, for example, the Democratic candidate for Congress from my district, from Youngstown, has any fear of losing the election um, in 2018. I mean, the interesting thing is he won overwhelmingly in Youngstown at the same time Donald Trump does, and he's a Democrat. In fact, being talked about as a as a possible candidate for president. So, you know, in 2020, if the Democrats field somebody who can speak to these working class voters, who maybe is from that area, if they go against, I think, their instinct to go harder left and instead go a little bit more to the middle, somebody who can speak to sort of these working class voters and try to bridge the divisions within the Democratic Party, um, then I think, you know, they have a real opportunity to take back the White House. But we'll have to, we'll have to see. In closing. Um, I axiomatically make no predictions whatsoever on anything involving um, Donald Trump. Having predicted he could not become president, I, you know, I, I retire. That was two and a half years ago. On the yes, I take the point that that and, and the way I would sort of try to harmonize our views is I do think there is a band of these tensions over time in the United States, and we're at a point of of high tension now. 
uh, there is the reassuring thing, it's not as bad as a civil war, but uh, I think that, that many of, I think that this is comparable in lots of ways to levels of mistrust in the late, late 19th uh, century. And I think it's, it's not just the harvest of the past 10 or 20 years of NAFTA, et cetera. I've been watching the Ken Burns Linovic Vietnam War series, which is really worth watching. And you see the seeds of, of many tensions of, of mistrust then. You have 50 years worth of uh, industrial change. So yes, I agree. It is a high point of a historically existing um, uh, tension. Good. Thank you. Um, if we could all thank the speakers in usual way, thank you.